and welcome back to Pike Online, the education track. We are excited to have you back with us. Um, and this speaker uh, is Kenny Borden, and he's talking about walled gardens for growing students. I've known Kenny for a while, um, and he teaches students and teaches how to understand data algorithms and the digital systems in the world around them. Uh, we were chatting before uh, because I wanted to fill out his blurb a little bit. He said he likes baking and dislikes security, sorry, cybersecurity. Um, we uh, assumed that this is perhaps a, a nefarious plot so he can steal all of your sourdough recipes. I guess we'll have to find out more uh, in the future. Um, Kenny will be taking questions at the end, so if you have them, throw them in the chat. Um, but for now, I am going to leave it to you, Kenny. Thanks, Nikki. So as Nikki said, she's known me since I was a growing student. And that's what we're going to be talking about today is about uh, the walled gardens that we construct for helping students to grow. Um, but before we get to that, uh, what I want to talk about is the difference between a walled garden, garden and an open plain. Uh, and which of those is the best uh, environment for students to learn? So world guns, uh, we've seen some examples of those today. Like if we're looking at Scratch or other block-based environments, you're giving students uh, a small area to play in uh, and it's nice and safe, they can't get too lost. Open planes, you might sit them down with a text editor and Python and a manual and say, have at it, kids. Uh, and so what I'm interested in, before I get too far into my talk, uh, Post in the chat, uh, and I'm not going to see it, but you'll be able to have a discussion amongst yourself whether you think walled gardens are better or whether you think open plains are better. Uh, and maybe someone will tell me afterwards how that went. Um, but um, before we get too far into it, let's talk about uh, who I am and how I spend my time. Uh, so uh, I am and have been for the past 10 years a tutor at the National Computer Science School. Uh, and recently, uh, with a, a couple of other tutors, we developed uh, a curriculum for uh, the students in that uh, uh, in that program to uh, learn about how to create virtual assistants. Um, and those are students who are in years 10 to 12. Uh, I also work at the Australian Computing Academy, uh, teaching teachers all across Australia, primary school and high school teachers, uh, how to teach kids to code. Uh, and I'm not only a person who teaches, I'm also a person who uh, is learning at the moment. I'm a student uh, doing complex systems, and don't worry about trying to read the small lettering in there. It's just, it's just an image. Uh, all right. So, what are the things that I learned when I was learning how to program? Um, did I learn with walled gardens or open planes? Well, it was a mix of both, right? Uh, weirdly enough, uh, one of the first programming environments I learned on was a graphics calculator. You could use the little buttons to type in uh, what was I later learned on basic code. Um, and you could make games like Snake and things like that. Uh, but in terms of open planes, I did things like a university degree where I learned a whole bunch of programming languages. Uh, I did data visualization. As a software engineer, it's all open planes. Everything's on the table. Um, and it may be that like you're looking at some of these things and going, are there really walled gardens? Like Game Maker, if you ever use that um, in the mid 2000s, you can make any sort of game. So is that really a walled garden? And HTML, you can really only display images and text and things like that. So is that really an open plane? Well, the truth of the matter is, is that um, you know we need to really define what walled gardens and open planes are. Uh, so when we're talking about walled gardens, we're talking about things that are uh, ensure that students don't get lost. And they're generally easy to learn and they're better suited to solve specific problems. Uh, and open planes are the opposite, where you want to give students room to grow. And they're often hard to learn, but they're better to solve more general problems. Uh, and so if you were listening to Linda's talk just before, um, she was talking about how to create open plane experiences for students. Um, so when we're talking about general and uh, specific and easy and hard, those things are spectrums. So when we're looking at open planes and walled guns, uh, we've got walled guns that are in the easy and specific corner, and we've got open planes, which are in the general and the hard corner. And now, some of you who are watching might be thinking, well, sure, we want things to be general and we want things to be easy. Can't we just stick things up in the corner there, get things that are both general and easy? Uh, and, uh, you know, the question is, is there a Garden of Eden in terms of walled gardens? Uh, something that's both open, but also safe. Um, 
Well, let's take a look. Um, so here are some examples of uh, tools that can be used in the classroom. And helpfully, Linda also mentioned that this is a thing that happens in classrooms a lot. You get robots that can do specific tasks and you have also have some robots uh, such as in another talk that we had earlier, like the uh, Lego NXT robots. Um, so in the chat at the moment, I want you to type in, you know, pick one of those robots there, like the Ozobot or the Sphero or the Microbit Bitbot, and say whether you think it's open or whether it's a walled uh, platform. And now, obviously, this is a bit subjective. I introduced the idea of it being a, a spectrum, but I'm interested in kind of, if you had to put them in one space or another, where would you put them? Um, so I'm just going to go through those robots now, if you don't know what they are. We've got the B-Bot, where you put in button commands and it follows exactly the instructions you gave it. We've got the Sphero, which you can program using an iPad and a block-based interface. We've got the Arduino, where you can plug in a bunch of wires and you can program it using the Arduino interface, which is in uh, C++. Uh, we've got an Ozobot, where you can draw using a marker on a... Um, piece of paper and it will follow the line and do different things based on the marks that you put in. We've got the Microbit Bitbot, which you can program using MicroPython. We've got the Lego NXT, which you can uh, program using Lego's own interface. And I think you can also program it in C++. Or I guess you can use a Raspberry Pi to connect a whole bunch of things together and um, have it work that way as well. All right. So I'm going to give you what I thought was the distribution of uh, walled garden to open planes uh, for these uh, different robotic platforms. So if you had younger students, this might be where you were thinking about it. You thought, like, a B-Bot's easy and specific. You can introduce that into your classroom uh, pretty easily, and the students will all pick it up. Uh, and the Arduino stuff and the Microbit stuff and the Lego stuff might be way too, too difficult if you've got younger students that might be uh, a bit out of their league for the moment. And something like the Sphero might be in that uh, Garden of Eden spot, just a little bit, uh, where you can pick it up uh, and you can start dragging around the blocks. They still get to explore a bit and uh, learn a bit about programming concepts. Uh, but if you've got older students, maybe that's a bit limiting because with a Sphero, you can get it to run around and do things. But once you've done that, it's you know you can't go much further outside of that. So maybe you think that the uh, Microbit Bitbot uh, gets a bit better inside of that Garden of Eden spot there. Uh, and the Arduino stuff is still a little complex, but it might be where you send your advanced students or something like that. And the truth of the matter is, is that there's no Garden of Eden for uh, for every single student. Uh, that all these teaching tools are transitional. You you can use them for a period of time until the students have learned enough, and then you've got to move on to the next thing that allows them to learn more general ideas. But is Arduino really that hard compared to blocks? Right, uh, like. Here on the left, we've got uh, some instructions that draw a square. And in the middle, we've got instructions that draw a square using Arduino. Now, it's a little bit more complex. There are a lot more, uh, you know, a lot more symbols and things like that. But conceptually, it's fairly similar. Like, the jump from those two things isn't that difficult. And in fact, you can, on the right here, we see we've got a list of uh, blocks uh, that are essentially mirroring what Arduino code can do. And so, you know, you can reduce that gap even further. So the question is, is, is it a bit of a false dichotomy having walled gardens and open planes? Could you uh, take something that's an open plane and squash it into a walled garden? And the answer is, yeah, of course you can. But, uh, you know, which is better for transitioning? Do we want to start with a walled garden and allow students to explore inside that zone? Um, and, you know, it's easy for them to explore, but there's not much room to grow outside of that. Or do we want to take open planes and do we want to scaffold it using libraries like that uh, library we saw here, which has the motor driver and just allows us to say, go left and go backward rather than having to type in electrical signals, which you might have to do with a normal Arduino library. Do we want to have those scaffolded open planes uh, where there's lots of room to grow, but actually if you go outside of the scaffolds, it's a bit hard know, to, to know where to go and to where ex to explore. Which of those is better? Well, the truth is you have to use both, right? You want to explore in those walled gardens and you want to provide boundaries in those open planes and allow the students to explore to the boundaries and then allow them to explore a bit larger in those boundaries until those open planes start to seem like they're walled gardens. Uh, if that seems a bit complicated, here's a flowchart which maybe makes you think about it. A bit in a bit more 
of a uh, cyclical way. You start with a simple problem and a specific tool, um, and where that, how specific that is depends on the year level. Um, and you start exploring harder or more general problems using that tool. Uh, and you'll only be able to go so, so far with certain tools, but you may be able to get uh, uh, a bit further as they learn more and more complex tools. And then you introduce a more open tool or a concept that is different that makes the, the problems that they were working on easier. Uh, and then you explore harder and more general problems and then you introduce more tools and you slowly make things, uh, uh, you know, uh, more challenging, but also more rewarding because they can solve uh, different problems. Uh, and now if that you don't quite know how to uh, take that into reality, well, here's what we do for uh, teaching kids um, from years three to 10. Um, so we start off with Python blocks and, you know, you've got something like, uh, a micro bit and you're showing a little butterfly on the micro bit and there are a whole bunch of skills you can learn like if statements and loops and things using those blocks and you can use those skills to do surprisingly general things um, but uh, here we've got an example of a course that we made which is about creating a smart garden um, using the micro bit which you can do entirely using blocks um, but at some point that uh, that walled garden of the python blocks starts to be become a bit restricting, especially if you want to do lists, if you want to do large programs, it becomes unwieldy uh, and you want to get a bit more open, uh, which is where we introduce the idea of MicroPython. Uh, and you have a text-based language and uh, if you're a programmer, you know that uh, having a text-based language over a visual one is always quite a lot uh, more helpful in general. Uh, and you can start to do more complex things. Uh, here we've got a simple example of um, scrolling uh, the 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 temperature or the um, humidity uh, on a micro bit, but you can get more complex examples until eventually you can build uh, and uh, play with that little micro bit bit bot on the right. Uh, and then once you've learned micro Python, it's not such a huge leap to then go on to learning Python, where you can learn about uh, manipulating files and playing with text and eventually making your own Flask web server or whatever it happens to be. And so you can see we've got this uh, scale from wall to open and from following to exploring. But at every step of the way, you are um, you know, following and then exploring. So if we zoomed in to that Python blocks section, uh, we're actually looking at not uh, different platforms, but different concepts, where we start with the wall of only being able to do outputs. In this example, we can only do butterflies or whatever. Um, you might show them how to input text, where they could do different text but that only gets you so far until you've got some kind of input which can vary the text. Uh, and then once you let them explore a bit more with that, where they can explore more than just a set of, a finite set of animals, uh, then you can start introducing the idea of uh, doing if statements. So, you know, if you've got uh, a temperature, uh, you can say uh, above this temperature, warn me that my plant might be in danger, or if uh, the moisture of the soil is too low, do this thing. Uh, and you can allow them to explore different projects that might use those if statements uh, and different sensors to do uh, more complex things. And then once you get past that, uh, you can uh, start talking about loops and doing more complicated things as well. Um, and so this general structure of taking uh, uh, these walled gardens and going from uh, the walled sections of them and making them more and more open is generally how structuring a project should really work out. Uh, and now, uh, this total thing was an example of what you can do within eight years of schooling, uh, but we don't always have eight years. Uh, sometimes we only have eight days. So I'm going to talk to you about uh, the project that we did for the National Computer Science School, which is uh, uh, virtual assistants in Python, and it's an eight-day camp where we get students from years 10 to 12 coming in, and uh, they go from some of them not knowing any Python uh, or any uh, very little programming to learning uh, how to create a web server that interacts with uh, a virtual assistant interface like Alexa uh, and interacts with APIs on the webs and uh, does some really cool things. Uh, and some of them come in with a lot of experience, and uh, that's also tricky because you've got to give them the open planes to explore in. Uh, so what does that look like in terms of uh, our walled gardens and our open planes? 
Well, so here are the project goals. Like I was saying, we want to teach them uh, Python and programming. We want to teach them about HTTP and the web. Uh, and we want to teach them about APIs. So, uh, you know, using other tools that other people have uh, created and uh, being able to get cool and useful information from that. Uh, and we want to teach them about text and voice user interfaces. And if you don't know what I'm talking about there, I'm talking about, you know, like Slack or well, that's not what the kids would be interested in, but like Facebook Messenger or Discord. Uh, and the voice interfaces are like Alexa or um, uh, Google Home and things like that. So this is what the, uh, the scale looked like for Python and the web. We started off with some basic Python. Obviously, Python is, can be general and hard, uh, but we started off with you know, the basics of you know, print this and uh, do something with this input. Then we moved on to doing something a bit more uh, general uh, and a little bit harder, which is doing requests, so getting information from online. Uh, and then we ended up with uh, not only getting information from online, but being able to create your own server and give back information when you're online. Uh, and I'll go a bit into a bit more detail on that. Uh, so in terms of connecting to those APIs using the request library, uh, we used we started off with simple custom APIs with text data. So we didn't want to overwhelm them at the start by making them get data, uh, which was complicated and they had to process. We just allowed them to uh, use the request library to get the text data. And once they got the text data, they had all the information that they needed. And then we introduced something slightly more complex, which was getting uh, uh, using our own custom made APIs. And we had simple JSON data. So they didn't have to do anything too complicated to get the JSON data out. And then we talked to them about uh, looking at real world example APIs, which uh, you know they can be a little bit more complex than the simple ones that we created because they have real world constraints uh, and they're often made for programmers who are a bit more experienced. Uh, and then we let them have at it. Um, so in that dotted line, uh, we said, you can do almost any HTTP API on the web now uh, with a little asterisk there. Uh, and that asterisk is some of these APIs are actually more complicated than that. Um, so for instance, the voice and text interface APIs, so the ones that connect to Facebook Messenger or Slack or Amazon Alexa, uh, they're a bit more complicated because you need to, to know uh, how to create your own web server that could respond to the requests they made to you. Uh, and so uh, even notice I removed the easy and the, uh, the easy and the specific uh, axes there because we're up in the top right hand corner of our diagram. Um, now, originally, when we first did this project, we started off by teaching them Facebook Messenger and uh, Slack as the first interface they interacted with. And that had them stuck in that top right corner. And then they found it really difficult in order to, uh, to interact with their virtual assistants they, they created. So what we did this year around uh, is we created a messaging app we called Nexus, uh, which had a simple API. You just needed to paste in the URL to your web server, uh, and it would put your message straight into the to the user interface. And so you didn't have to uh, learn all the uh, complicated JSON that you needed to use in order to put things on an Amazon Alexa or inside of Slack, and you didn't have to learn uh, how to get the keys and the tokens and do authentication. We just made it dead simple. And this is part of the reason why uh, I'm not such a huge fan of security. It gets in the way of teaching sometimes. Um, and in programming concepts that we had to use at each stage uh, also had that similar structure. We could teach if statements when we were doing requests. We could teach data structures when we talked about JSON. We could teach loops once we'd talked about accessing in items inside of uh, that JSON structure. If you had lists of information, you could get it out. We taught functions in order to be able to use them inside of uh, Flask. Uh, and respond to input. Uh, and we also uh, used a similar thing for deploying servers where we used a crop learning initially, which was really easy, but specific because you couldn't deploy your own infrastructure there uh, and replet in the middle. And in those dotted lines, we allowed them to explore those extra things if they, they wanted to. Um, so the conclusion is that Worldverse is open as a spectrum, easy, hard, general, specific. But there's no garden of Eden because it depends on what level your students are at. Uh, teaching tools are transitional. Uh, so any tool that you use or concept you introduce, it's a transition to something that's bigger and more general. Um, 
you should let students explore in world gardens. Uh, they're great. That's uh, what makes a world garden great is that it's not dangerous. They don't get lost or they don't think, I don't know what to do next. Um, but you also want to allow them to get, go into bigger and more open planes to solve more general problems. And by providing artificial boundaries, you can uh, help them feel like they're safe and they're like, like they're in a walled garden and uh, slowly introduce them to the more open planes. Uh, so that's the end of my talk. Uh, I've got a bunch of questions here because, you know, I think it's nice sometimes to have those walled gardens. But if you've got other questions uh, that are more general, you're very welcome to ask them. Thank you so much, Kenny. That was fantastic. Um, really interesting discussions. And there were a bunch of comments on um, walled or open or planes or semi-enclosed. Um, there's some interesting horticultural specialties, I think. <laughs> um, uh, we do have a little bit of time for questions. Um, and one of the questions that I will throw at you, not from this slide, uh, although we'll get to that maybe, is that moving from scratch to text-based programming, i.e. from a walled to an open environment, is really hard. Um, and, and just wondering if you had anything to share on how you think about that transition. Yeah, um, it is really hard. You're right. Um, and part of the uh, way that we at the ACA like to make that transition is to start with blocks that look like um, text-based programming. And now I think that might be maybe a little backwards. I don't know. We still haven't quite figured out how to go directly from scratch to, uh, to a more complicated thing. Some platforms take uh, takes uh, the scratch and translate it into JavaScript and then use that as a, uh, a stepping tool to learn how to um, do more complicated programming. But that actually provides a lot of scaffolding that is hard to move away from. Um, so I don't really have a good answer there other than uh, scratch maybe a, a, a walled garden that you want to move away from uh, quickly, even though it's like, it's a really nice walled garden. It's a very nice garden. It's a garden that's hard to transition from. There's no ladder up the wall, so to speak, if we're talking of scaffolding. Sorry, I, should yeah, I see you, myself out? Is that the... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you kind of have to make a lateral move um, from the scratch garden rather than one that goes more complicated, I think. Nice, nice. Um, well, uh, let's, let's choose... Actually, you can choose. We've got two minutes. What question would you like from this list of your questions? Uh, all right. I'm going to say the one uh, that says, can you expand on why there are no gardens of Eden? Uh, I think the thing is, is that um, obviously the gardens of Eden are at different levels, but there's no like universal garden of Eden because as soon as you create that garden of Eden, um, you uh, make it so that it's actually, uh, you can solve harder problems than you would have expected to before. So people, um, you know, push off and make something in the other direction uh, and it starts to become uh, a more general tool. Uh, and once you've got a more general tool, you can also pull that thing back and make it easier by providing scaffolding. And so we get this branching out of uh, expectations that happen over time. And so uh, if you look at uh, what you expect students to do, it actually gets uh, more and more complex over time because we're starting to produce better and better tools. And I guess that also relates to one of the, the comments um, that exactly where in that spectrum of walled garden to open plane a particular platform or tool sits also often depends quite a lot on the the teacher and their familiarity and skills in delivering and teaching with that tool which is a really interesting uh comment um we've got another 30 seconds i'm going to ask what this complex system thing is that you mentioned all right uh well it's complex and it's this system uh so it may take a while uh, it's basically about uh, uh, taking the idea of, um, you know, science is used to understand things by breaking them down into smaller pieces. Um, complex systems is the idea that, well, you can break things down to smaller pieces, but sometimes the relationship between those pieces disappears when you break it down. And if you break it down too much, you lose some of those that important information. So complex system is about understanding not only the small parts of a system, but the way that they interact with each other. Um, and, you know, if you've thought about uh, modeling pandemics and things like that, that's exactly the sort of things that I've been uh, talking about and doing in my complex systems degree. Not something I want to try and scratch, certainly. 
No. That would would no. be would be quite challenging. Fantastic. But, but there's a well, surprising number of walled gardens inside of um, inside of I, these institutions. I I can imagine that definitely. Yeah. I would I would definitely not be surprised to hear that. Um, well, that is all the time we have for now. So thank you very much, Kenny. Uh, we now have a nine and a half minute break, and then we will be back with the student showcase. Uh, which is an exciting opportunity to hear uh, what a bunch of current high school students have been up to in all of their copious amounts of spare time uh, over the last few months. So thank you once again, Kenny, and we shall see you all anon.